Gishi just arrived right now to investigate the situation on the ground, to help the people on the ground. It's a, it's a very dangerous situation. Reverend Majed El Shafi is dedicated to rescuing religious minorities who are victims of oppression and genocide. In 2004, he founded One Free World International. El Shafi converted from Islam to Christianity when he was 18 years old. He was imprisoned and tortured in an Egyptian prison for declaring his faith in Jesus Christ. So Christians and Jews and others like the Baha'i are caught in the crossfire. That's correct. We are in HT uh, IDB uh, camp right now uh, uh, in Suleimani, Iraq. So this is Shamu, and he's saying that we don't have a future anymore. We can see that we don't see how it can get better. They, uh, they attacked us, ISIS attacked us, they killed everything, including our hope, and they took more than 5,000 girls uh, as young as 10 years old. We were like uh, the wives of the whole uh, ISIS, the whole guys in the ISIS. Yeah, we were uh, abused sexually by all of them, all the guys in the ISIS. There were a lot of guys over there, we couldn't uh, count them. We know that ISIS takes, particularly Yazidis, Christians, the young women, turns them into, quote, wives or sex slaves. One of these girls, and I recall, she was nine years old, that they, they used to rape her 20 times a day. The deadly bomb blast in August 28, 2012 in Druze and Christian areas. The arrest of many of the Christians and other minorities and torturing them on the hand of the rebels. You cannot have democracy in the Middle East without two main foundations. Number one, freedom of religion. This massacre has to be stopped. These kids, we met with kids that they lost their family member. We met a girl that lost her mom and dad in an in, in explosion. And it's creating new generation of pain. And if the international society did not interfere now, this would be a genocide. More people will be killed, more people will be hurt. And sadly, the world is doing too little and too late. You've succeeded in rescuing a number of those women. Describe, without creating a vulnerability for the process, how you go about finding them and getting them out. We was able to locate four markets where they sell these girls. This operation bankrupted our organization. But I will tell you something. I will sell my suit, my furniture, everything I own to get these girls out. And I have no regrets about it. So Majed El Shafi is a man of God who likes to uh, exercise his faith in action. He doesn't uh, seek to save souls, he actually seeks to buy people. These days he's buying Yazidis, he also works to try and save persecuted minorities of every kind from all over the Middle East. This is Majed El Shafi. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, my second time in Idea City, and it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, I want to thank Moses. I think the relationship between me and Moses is, uh, we become very close friends very fast. 
It's not every day you see Egyptian and Jewish getting closer together. <laughs> One day, uh, <laughs> that's actually a true story. One day it was a Passover, and uh, Moses contacted me and he said, uh, my sister Libby having a Passover, Majid, would you like to come to be with us in Passover, Egyptians and Passover? <laughs> and I told him I would love to, and he said, oh, it would be an honor that we have you. You will be the first life Egyptian <laughs> that we have with us. I told him, Moses, how many dead Egyptians did you have? <laughs> Is a question, really. And yes, we can love. Because life has to go on. Even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of darkness, light will always prevail. My name is Majid Shafai. I used to be a prisoner back home in Egypt. I was arrested. I was tortured for seven days in Egypt. They hang me upside down. They took the nails of my foot. They beat me. They slashed my back. And they put salt and lemon in my open wounds. But... In this cell, in this dark cell, I understood the meaning of life. And you don't understand the meaning of life until you face death head on. Until you smell death, until you see it, until you touch it with your own hand. I understood the meaning of life. And quite honestly, I just, with more respect to the previous speakers, I don't give a shit when the life starts and when life ends. Trust <laughs> me. I'm sorry, I really don't care. It can end tomorrow, it's like, that's why I met me now. I just hope this will end before I pay my American Express. Seriously, I'm just... <laughs> it's not about when it ends and when, it's, when it starts, it's what you will do with it. It's what the legacy that you will leave behind, and not just personal legacy, but how many people you will touch and how many people you will change their lives. That's the true meaning of life for me. It was in this prison, in this dark cell, when I understood and I learned that I would not let the doubt of the death stop me or destroy me or define me, but I will let the hope of life guide me. It was in this cell that I understood that after every night there is new morning carrying new day, after every storm there is sunshine, and after every persecution, there is a second chance. It was in this cell that I learned that life will prevail. After I escaped out of Egypt from the death penalty, I stole jet ski and I crossed the border to Israel. Some of you would tell me, but you are reverend, you are a man of God, how could you steal a jet ski? I stole the jet ski, sue me. Like, I'm trying to act that your opinion matters to me, but, like, uh, help me here. <laughs> Through United Nations and Amnesty International, I came here to Canada 15 years ago, and that's when I started One Free World International. One Free World International, now we have branches in 28 different countries. But here today, specifically, speaking about something happened three years ago when the world woke up and found the reason genocide. So from the Armenians to the Holocaust to Rwanda, Darfur, Bosnia, the world woke up on Yazidi genocide in the Sengar Mountain, where ISIS took more than 7,000 women and sold them. They took their men, they killed them in front of them, they took their children. 7,000 Yazidi women was sold as slaves. We was able to locate four markets. Every gear would be sold between two to four thousand American dollars, depending on her age, her beauty, if she's virgin or not. Now, this prices go higher because now it's only three thousand Yazidi gears remain in Raqqa, the capital of ISIS, and the prices went to 15,000 because supplies and demand. And I had to do something, and we went to the front line and by the grace of God, we was able to rescue more than 600 Yazidi girls out of ISIS territory. <laughs> 
some of them directly and some of them indirectly. And we're still going, and we'll keep going until the end, until we will be able to rescue, to the best of our ability, every and each one of them. We started to communicate, thank you. We started to communicate, it's okay, is, uh, there is many Egyptian in the house or something? People clapping too much. <laughs> it's only Egyptian clap too much, like only brown people will do that. <laughs> oh, I'm not, and, and I'm not politically correct, I apologize. <laughs> it was good people like Moses Neimer, and I know that he didn't speak about this, and I know that he would not speak about this. But how many of you knew that actually Moses bought and rescued 33 girls? Through his partnership with One Free World International, this man, the man that survived, he and his family Holocaust, was able to turn around and save another 33 girls. And people will come to me and will tell me, are you a Yazidi? And this is a question that I hear over and over and over. Are you a Yazidi? You are helping them, you are going to the front line, I recall that I get shot at seven times in the last five years. Many of them was in the front line with ISIS. And many people will come and say, are you a Yazidi? Are you part of this minority group? I need to tell you something extremely important. You don't have to be Yazidi to help Yazidis. <laughs> I am a Yazidi when I'm helping them. I'm a Jewish when I'm standing against anti-Semitism. I'm a Sunni when I'm fighting for the Muslim community in Burma and in China. I am a Shia when I'm fighting for the Ismaili. I'm a Baha'i when I'm fighting for the, for, for the minorities in Iran. I'm a Ahmadiyya when I'm fighting for the minority in Pakistan. I'm a woman when I'm fighting for equality. And I'm gay when I'm fighting for the killing of homosexual people in Russia and in Iran. I'm a black, I'm white, and my favorite color, I'm brown. My close friends will call me brown sugar. <laughs> my vi Thank you very much. <laughs> my very, very close friends will call me 50 shade of brown. <laughs> Thank you for the five people that clap their hands. <laughs> I'm a human. It doesn't matter if you believe or you don't believe in anything. As long as you are human like me, I will fight side by side for you. Because the meaning of life, if we stop fighting for each other, we lose our humanity. And this is the true Christian heart. I refuse to hate even my enemy because I choose to love. I refuse to take a revenge because I choose to forgive. I refuse to worship death because I choose life. And many people in our life, they will choose life. One of these families, let's just call them for security purpose, family M. M. Just let's call them M. Family M is three, three sisters, six kids. Isis came to their villages 4 a.m., took their, took their men, put them on the floor, on their knees, and they shot them in front of their daughters and in front of their wives. The three girls was sold over and over, was gang raped, was forced to drink from toilet. 
That's true story. The little one, as young as 10, was sold, and they made an auction about her. Who will pay more will take her. The very little one was one year old at the time. And ISIS fighter took her from the leg. They didn't feel that she's important or necessary. And he just smashed her to the, to the wall to kill her. Tried to kill her. A family we get to know, we get to help. And this family was in despair. And through my communication with them, the question was always if they want to commit suicide or not, if they want to end their lives or not. There is no hope. There is no tomorrow. It's simply over. The nightmares, the humiliation, the stigma, and they are between life and death, and there is no hope. And the question if they commit suicide, who will win this battle? They win or ISIS fighters win? In absolute despair, and there is no hope. What do you think happened next? Please welcome with me Family M on the Canadian soil for the first time in Canada. Can you give me a microphone? Anything you want to tell? Come, 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 come. Anything you want to tell these people? Yeah. Thank you so much, Canada. 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 And in the end, if there is one thing we need to remember, we need to remember that. Our enemy have very strong army, have very strong weapon, but we have the Lord Almighty. They can always kill the believers, but they, can, can, they cannot kill the belief of our hearts. They can always kill the dreamer, but no one can kill the dream. Have a wonderful life. Thank you.